state and local public health workforce. Uh, we're happy to be holding this event during National Public Health Week. The March 2023 issue of Health Affairs focused on lessons for public health from the COVID-19 pandemic, had uh, nearly a dozen studies looking at a variety of lessons. We encourage you to look throughout the issue. Today, we're focusing on one paper in particular that took a close look at the departure of so many of the staff from state and local public health, from the state and local public health workforce. Uh, in the article, uh, the authors examined the changes in the public health workforce between 2017 and 2021, so before and during the pandemic, and found that about half the workforce left their jobs during this period, and some portions of the workforce had even higher departure rates. But this is really a call to action for policymakers to address uh, strains on this workforce, uh, to address ongoing needs, and to prepare us for future concerns. So during National Public Health Week, we're pleased to be able to hold an event that focuses on these findings. We'll hear first uh, from Drs. Uh, Kostrucci and Fraser, who I will uh, turn to in a moment, um, uh, to present the research that I just described. And then we'll have a panel discussion with some state and local health department officials talking about the issues that this raises. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A button. You can submit questions at any time in that box. I'll do my best to bring them into the conversation. Um, it helps if they are short and if they are submitted not uh, right at the last uh, minute. Um, and I'll, as I say, I can't make any promises, but I'll do my best to bring those into the discussion. Uh, after the panel, we'll hear again from our authors for some closing words. I want to take this opportunity to thank the De Beaumont Foundation uh, typically, an event like this, Lunch and Learn, would be for Health Fairs Insiders Only, which is a, a premium subscription service for us. But with, thank, with support from the De Beaumont Foundation, we're able to make this event open to all. If you like it uh, and want to uh, participate in future events, we encourage you to become a Health Fairs Insider. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Brian Castrucci and Michael Frazier to set the stage by discussing uh, the paper that was in the March 2023 issue. Uh, Brian Castrucci is president and CEO of the De Beaumont Foundation. He has uh, held leader, leadership positions in the Georgia Department of Health, the Texas Department of State Health Services, and the Philadelphia Department of Health. He has his doctorate in public health leadership from the Gilling School of Global Public Health at uh, UNC Chapel Hill. Michael Frazier is the CEO of ASTO, the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. ASTO is the national nonprofit organization representing public health agencies in the United States. Uh, previously, he was the CEO of the Pennsylvania Medical Society and before that CEO of the Association of Maternal and Child Health Programs, AMCHIP, uh, organization I've worked with in my past as well. He has his doctorate and master's in sociology from the U University of Massachusetts Amherst and the uh, master of science in management from the Broad School of Management at Michigan State University. So thank you so much for uh, the work you present in the journal, and uh, it's my pleasure to be able to turn it over to you to give our audience a sense of what you found that will tee up the conversation we'll have uh, subsequently. Great. Thanks, Alan. Nice to see you again. I appreciate the opportunity. I think Brian's going to kick us off, but I just wanted to um, say thanks for, for focusing on this issue as the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials the public health workforce and public health professionals at the state and territorial level, and of course our partners federally and locally and tribally uh, are going through a lot. And uh, it started before COVID and was exacerbated by COVID. So um, fortunately, thanks to De Beaumont and the work of, of Brian and his team, uh, as well as our partners at the Harvard Chan School and the University of Minnesota, we now have some data to really describe this problem. I think by the end of this session, we want to actually get to some action. Uh, a lot of people are talking about the problem, but I think it's time we start addressing it in the many ways that we can. So thanks again for highlighting this. And, and Brian, you want to share some of these data with us? Absolutely, Mike. Thank you. And, and I think it's, um, you know, happy National Public Health Week to everyone who's listening. Uh, I would hope that we could take Public Health Week as a time to celebrate public health and reflect on the last year's accomplishments and achievement. But I think this year, we are really at a crossroads. We're coming out of, um, you know, to some degree, coming out of a pandemic. May 11th is National Pandemic is Over Day, as declared by the Biden administration. But we know uh, COVID will be with us 
probably for quite some time. And we have a public health workforce that I think did everything they possibly could to fight COVID and just the politicization of public health, some of the bullying and harassment, the lack of resources has made it extraordinarily difficult for public health to be effective during this time. And actions have consequences. And these are the consequences. What you're seeing on the screen is that between 2017 and 2021, as Alan said, almost half of the workforce is no longer in their job. So what we really did is, you know, if you get to the brass tacks of the data, we looked at staffing lists from 2017 and then compared them to 2021. So you could explain this away saying half the workforce just changed jobs, went to a different health department, or maybe they got promotion and went to a different health department. That's unlikely, given some of the other data that we've seen around intent to leave. What we saw here with these data is that what happened between 2017 and 2021 is that people who said they were planning to leave in 17, they actually left. And people who said they weren't planning to leave, they left too. And so this is a, an exodus of unprecedented proportion in public health. And more importantly, if you look at the under 35 workforce, almost three quarters of that workforce has moved on. And so we always have known that we've had a delay in retirements going back you know, quite some time. And that when you can only delay retirement for so long, that's, that's just a fact of life. And that if we start to see these retirements and that trend combines with this early exodus of public health employees. When these trends combine, it will be catastrophic. It will be the perfect storm. And what we need to remember is that this is on top of existing deficiencies within the workforce. We had a need for 80,000 FTE to just make us able to deliver the basic foundational public health services. And if the staffing departures continue, we'll need another 130,000 people. This at some point could mean we'll have more vacancies than we have staff in our, in our governmental public health workforce. And this is something that we need to aggressively address. Now let's remember that we have an unprecedented investment from the federal government in public health, $3.2 billion in federal money to rebuild the public health infrastructure. But the Beatles taught us that that money can't buy you love and it can't <laughs> fix the public health system because FTE caps are set by governors, salaries are set by state and county level HR. These are barriers that are not going to be easily undone by just an influx of federal money. And we are already underwater. So if, if, the, if the public health infrastructure money was there to teach us how to swim, they need to teach us to float first. And we have health departments with 30, 40, 50% vacancy rates. So they're already behind. Maybe this money helps us even catch up. But getting to the point where we have that necessary and robust public health infrastructure to fight pandemics, we are a long way from that and it is getting worse. And while I don't wanna suggest that this is unique to public health, what is unique to public health is the public's reaction. We have Senator Sanders talking about health care shortages. When you add that four letter word to the back of health, it changes the conversation. We understand that if police are leaving, then we may be less safe and that if healthcare workers are leaving, we may not get the medical care we need. And if teachers are leaving, our children won't get the education they need. But if public health workers are gone, far too few people understand the consequences for themselves or for society at large. And so this, you know, we are really right now taking a jackhammer to the foundation of our own house, but we are debating the color of the wallpaper and how the drapes hang. 
When you lose the foundation of your house, everything else in your home is in jeopardy. And that's where we are right now. We are at a very complex moment in public health, like the military leaving Vietnam. We are in a, have an extraordinarily complex relationship with the public at this point, and not all of the public, but a small minority of a very loud public that is choosing to turn money back to the federal government instead of using it to treat and prevent HIV and AIDS. Or we have governors who've chosen to undertake um, investigations into vaccine fraud where there is none. So this is the assault that is happening on our workforce. And we must understand that with the bullying, the low salaries, the stress, the, this confluence of factors has led to this departure. The early exodus out of the public health workforce should be a major national issue. It should be discussed along with the Ukraine war and inflation and everything else that is a threat to our safety, security, and economic prosperity. Because if we don't understand that linkage between public health and everything our nation is about, we are gambling with our future. You can read more in the actual article. These are the top level findings. This is what I want you to tell your friends. What I want you to call your mom with tonight. Hey mom, three quarters of the public health workforce under 35 have left their job. And, and she won't know why that's important. Then you need to explain why that's important, right? Talk to, you know, when you go to your, your church or your synagogue or wherever you worship, tell people about this. This has to be our call to action moving forward and understand why the money, the 3.2 billion from the, from the CDC is not enough to fix this problem singularly. Yeah, yeah. So, well, I mean, I, Mike, I thanks, Brian. I, you're always such a great champion for this and so many issues, and and are also able to say things I can't from where I sit. So I appreciate listening to you. <laughs> but you know, I I think this is an alarm moment. I think this the urgency uh, uh, of this workforce shortage um, of folks, you know, leaving uh, is appropriately called an exodus. I think that there are many uh, similarities to what's happening in healthcare for sure, but there's been so much attention to the clinical workforce and not to what's happening in the public health workforce. Um, so, you know, this article was really meant to talk about that, to bring light to that. I think the point you're making about funding is really important. The, the, um, 3.2 billion that states can use and big cities can use, and by extension, locals will be able to use for, for hiring is really backfilling a lot of, of holes, um, folks hired during COVID that need to be uh, sustained. Um, and it's a five year, so 3.2 billion divided by five years, about 600 million a year through 107 grantees. It's not gonna be the solution to a workforce problem. And I think that's important for everybody to understand in this case, the the, the tendency is to push for big, you know, big federal investment, which obviously is appreciated, um, big national programs, which obviously are important, but this is a state problem. So, you, you know, we have to go state by state, territory by territory, and obviously the extension locally, tribally, and really identify what's going on in, in these certain um, cases. So, for example, civil service reform that Brian mentioned, that's a government-wide problem. It's certainly not something the federal government's going to be able to do anything about in, in local areas, states included. But every state's going to have to look at their pay scale and what they're paying. If you can get a better paying job outside of government, why would you do it? Um, so, you know, again, if folks are making decisions on pay, the state government can't compete. Um, the one thing that health departments can do is, is tout their mission. Um, we, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about publichealthcareers.org. It's a website that we support with the CDC Foundation and lots of other partners that talks um, about the, you know, the fun you can have in public health, the good you can do in public health, the opportunities that folks have in public health, and actually highlights through um, sort of job previews and, and videos of, of public health jobs, uh, what those jobs are like to give people a sense of that. So definitely want to ask people to help share publichealthcareers.org. But if you're um, you know looking to solve this problem, again, it's going to have to be state by state because states set the pay rates, states establish the FTE caps. Um, you know, there are uh, state funds involved in hiring. And as Brian mentioned, there are um, some states that are turning back federal funding uh, for, for lots of things. Uh, so it's a, it's tough out there, but there are things we can do in health departments 
Um, we can make them cultures in which employees thrive, even if the pay is low. Uh, we can really leverage um, the good that public health does. And you know, at the end of the day, I think those are, are huge recruiting opportunities. This is a complex problem. That's a pipeline problem. It's a retention problem. It's a policy problem. And you know, with the with the brain power we have in a group like this, I think we can certainly advance this issue and, and begin to address it in many ways. But the notion that you know, 3.2 billion, we're solved this problem. Let's move on. It, we're we're nowhere near that yet, and and we've got to get real serious about the urgency of this if we're going to sustain the public health capacity we need, as Brian mentioned. And just a couple of questions that we that I'm seeing in the in the chat, just to answer them quickly. Um, the data do not tell us where people are necessarily going. Are they going to higher paying consulting jobs, um, or are they going to academia? What we know is that they're leaving, and we just this is one of the biggest issues we have, and we need to recognize this is a field. We don't have particularly good workforce surveillance. We have the ASTO and NATO profile, we have pH wins, but we don't have a mechanism that allows us to track people once they leave the field. Uh, this, this wins analysis that we did is novel because we have not really had these kinds of multi-year matched data sets that we could use. In this sense, when we're talking about the public health services workforce, we are talking about state and local governmental public health departments. So the very physical, you know, defined by the sample of the very physical agency. This does not mean that someone working at a local nonprofit in public health, or even if there's a public health specialist at a uh, law enforcement agency who's not otherwise funded and paid by the health department, they wouldn't be captured. Um, and, I, and I do think we need to understand more, more broadly, not just in public health, but where folks are going. What, what I do know is this. We had people who made the commitment to governmental public health. ASPPH data has shown that not many people who are leaving schools of public health are going into governmental public health. We know that not everyone, actually a relatively small percentage, less than one out of five people who work in governmental public health actually have an MPH or formal training in public health. What we know is that there were a whole bunch of people who made that commitment to work in governmental public health, to, to go to a governmental public health department to fulfill their mission, you know, their own personal mission and they're gone. That is a retention problem, which is just compound the recruitment problem that we already have with kind of government HR, the, the lack of real um, embracing of talent management, talent acquisition. My wife ran a recruiting department, and I saw all that she did to source candidates for her organization. We don't really do that in government, uh, especially in smaller government operations kind of post and pray instead of recruit for our for our new talent. And so holding on to those who've made the commitment, I think is, is really important. And it, we just have not been able to do that. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Brian and Michael. I think that's a great start and I am seeing more and more questions pour in. So I think it's a good time for me to bring on our panelists who will provide a little bit more of an on the ground perspective and then we'll, uh, Will you all back in for some thoughts as well? Uh, but uh, this is a great introduction. We're so pleased to have been able to uh, publish the paper. Let me introduce our uh, panelists for the next uh, uh, part of our agenda. Uh, Ann Zink is the Chief Medical Officer of the Alaska Department of Health and the President of ASTO. Uh, Pramod uh, Duvetti is the Health Director of the Lynn County Department of Public Health in Iowa and the incoming president of the National Association of County and City Health Officials. And Nicole Alexander Scott was uh, until a, a little more than a year ago, the director of the Rhode Island Department of Health. Uh, we did have someone from LA County who unfortunately had to cancel, uh, you know, sometimes your board of supervisors calls you in for a meeting. Uh, so uh, we were hoping to have two uh, county and two state, but we're thrilled to have the three of you with us. Um, so just to get us started, I think, um, first of all, I'm sure our audience will benefit from a little bit of context about each of your departments, just a, a sense of sort of where you're uh, coming from. But I thought maybe just to get started, if you could give your own experience 
associated with the findings uh, we just heard from Drs. Kostrucci and Frazier. Uh, each of you have certainly experienced uh, the staffing uh, challenges and uh, presumably some of the declines during the period uh, in the study. And I think it'd be great to hear a little bit about um, how you've uh, uh, how you've experienced that. Uh, Anne, maybe I could start with you. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. And it is a true honor to be here and happy Public Health Week uh, to everyone out there. It is, um, I oftentimes, I'm currently recruiting for a public health director and I tell people it's the best job on the planet. Uh, and it is a, just an incredible gift to work in public health. And so it's fun to celebrate. Um, but I think it's also really important to recognize the challenges. And I appreciate this article, the De Beaumont Foundation. I really love Brian's comment on post and pray, uh, our uh, current uh, period, uh, how we uh, try to recruit and the work that we could do better. You know, I comment on a couple of different things. Uh, first of all, I think about the workforce thinking about coming into public health. Um, and I think that there isn't a good understanding of what public health does, particularly state, local, county. Um, who are you? What do you do? It's not like, you know, you grow up and you see your teacher and you're like, you're really cool. I want to be like you. Um, and there isn't that in the same sort of way to say, I want to be a state public health leader or I want to be a county public health leader. Like that isn't just a place that a lot of people see. So I think we need to do better at sharing that. A lot of comments on pay. Uh, that is one of our biggest uh, challenges when I try to recruit people in. People say, this is the job of a lifetime. I would love to come work with you in a second. It'd be, you know, cutting my salary in half. It would be, I'm caring for my kids. I am the sole caregiver or family, you know, income. And I just can't do that on this pay. State and local counties are really hard to increase pay and salary. And so that's really, really challenging to, to recruit people in. And then as previously mentioned, um, not only just the perception of what we do, but then the political nature of it. And so do I want to get into the middle of that? Like, what's that really going to be like? Uh, am I going to be harassed at the grocery store? Um, how does that space? So I think that those are the real barriers that I see coming in, uh, as well as figuring out how to just make sure that the right candidates hear about the job and are able to share it. And I really appreciate ASTO and the Development Foundation and others, and I'm really thinking about how we can share what that space looks like. So the second group of people, those who are currently working with us, and I think this is a lot of what that article is, we have seen a huge exodus. And I think it's also multifactorial. Uh, in the state of Alaska, where I work, uh, there were a lot of just career public servants who the pandemic hit and they were like, okay, here I am. I was planning to retire, but I am going to make it and I'm going to stay in. So we saw a lot of people really put off their own personal needs uh, for staying and serving in state government. And as things started to shift, uh, they were like, okay, that was fun, but I'm 72 or <laughs> I am I've been meaning to retire and I'm out. So I think that there was some catch up that we were seeing in that space. I think the political nature of it also changed. I remember really clearly uh, mid-pandemic, uh, an epidemiologist said to me, I used to go to the grocery store and if someone asked me what I did, I stood up with pride and I said, I work with public health. And she said, now I just don't tell people directly what I do because I'm not sure how they're gonna respond. And that's changed my entire perception of my work. And I think that that really kind of speaks uh, to how the public has perceived public health and how people are perceiving their own jobs. Um, I'm a practicing emergency medicine physician, and someone said to me once about when you're unable to do your work or when you're criticized or there's workplace violence, it's kind of this uh, denting and this moral denting of your soul um, and this moral injury that takes place. And I think that that's happened a lot during the pandemic, a lot of moral injury of really putting your heart and soul out there, doing absolutely phenomenal work uh, and being criticized for it for all sorts of reasons um, and, and not seeing that space. And then the big thing that I don't think we've talked about enough, and I don't think that this paper uh, really had the capacity to look at, is all of the structural support that goes into supporting our staff. How long does it take procurement to get out? What does it mean to have grants go out? How much can I update the website? And I think in general, there has been a lack of funding for the infrastructure and state and local government in general. And it's not fun to be able to you know, tell a local partner that you are going to, they won the grant or the RFP and you're going to get them the funds and it takes six months or a year for procurement to actually do it. Or you have the perfect candidate and they said yes to the job and it takes a month, a month and a half for HR to process that. So I think that there's a lot of just inefficiencies in state government that have gotten a lot worse uh, over time. And I would say that that's uh, in, in our state, a big driver of why we're seeing a lot of people uh, leave that kind of moral injury of, I'm here to do this great job uh, and I can't actually do it uh, because I don't have the basic tools to be able to make my system work, um, be it, heat in my building or <laughs> procurement on the back end. Um, and so those things happen. Um, and then the last thing I would just say is um, as we look forward and as we move forward, there was a comment from Ashish Shah recently where he said, 
uh, you know, if you ever have the opportunity to work in public health and government, it is the greatest honor of a lifetime. And so I always tell my staff, this may not be your forever job, but I always want this to be the best job, the most rewarding job you ever had in your career. It might be exhausting. You may get paid way less. It may not be perfect. And so what can we do to make sure that we're increasing pay and benefits? I think that's the one. What way can we make sure that we're increasing autonomy and respect for our workforce? And then what ways can we cultivate creativity and leadership? So I think that those are kind of the three buckets that we all need in our workplace. Because um, burnout is not a failure of a person. Burnout is not uh, doing more yoga. Burnout is a system that is not supporting you in the job that you came here to do. So to not have our, our workforce burn out, we have to make sure that we've got the systems to support them to be the best that they possibly can be in their space. Great, thank you. You've put a lot out there that I know we're gonna uh, do go into a little bit more detail on some of those, but it's a great place to start. Um, uh, let's see, I think uh, let's bring in the, uh, the, the local perspective, I think would be good. So uh, Pramod, if you wanna uh, bring, uh, tell us a little bit about what you've experienced. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. And uh, uh, happy Public Health Week for all of my colleagues across this uh, beautiful nation. And, you know, there are a lot of things have already been shared and talked, and I don't intend to repeat those things. But one of the things that this current conversation has reminded me is really the Institute of Medicine reports that the very first report which came out in 1988, it clearly uh, said uh, boldly and loudly that public health, governmental public health was in disarray. And then there were series of uh, other reports came out from the same uh, Institute of Medicine uh, they said the same thing over and over again. Yet, even after this pandemic, we are, I don't know if we are in a better place. Uh, so it's a really an ongoing challenge. And another report that I would also point out, uh, which uh, the, the, the title of the report is, uh, who will keep public healthy in this century? So this article in particular is really compelling and profoundly telling that something needs to be uh, done. Something concrete needs to be done. And Anne has already described a lot of those things. Uh, I would pick up on some of the, those challenges uh, that has played out in our real life. So staff burnout, staff recruitment, um, and you know, staff, uh, the, how we have local and state health agencies have failed. Uh, you know, uh, the salary has always been a problem. People move. And you know, one interesting thing about all of this is really when I started my career way back in 1991, I mean, I, as a graduate student in public health, uh, there were hardly uh, any undergraduate program in public health, uh, mostly, uh, you know, the graduate schools, but not a lot. He, he, even at Iowa, it was known as preventive medicine, not public health. So now we have a lot of, a lot of uh, public health programs throughout our country, yet we are unable to recruit uh, staff in our local and state health agencies. Uh, and this is really creating a problem for our future, uh, particularly among our younger staff, right? Uh, and, and the article says that 80% of workers under the age of 35 leaving the field. This is serious. And I am very serious about this because this not only impact our current operation, but it also means how we are going to face the public health challenges in the future. It also impacts our leadership, who will or who is likely to lead our public health agencies in local and state health departments. And you know, when people leave, we also lose the expertise. 
and that's profound. And you know, look at the pandemic. You know, some of our colleagues who have left. You know, it would be um, challenging to fill the, those expertise back in our operations. Uh, with regard to the uh, benefits or the, the the circumstances under which people work, uh, and uh, did a lot of, uh, talk talked about uh, political turmoil. I mean, how many hate mails or, or abusive uh, phone calls you had to field? I mean, that really creates so much, so much problems for our colleagues. Uh, political pressure is always there. And if you make, uh, the pandemic has also uh, demonstrated how risky our job is, right? I mean, if you don't please your bosses, then you are um, not going to be liked. Uh, and a lot of states are also watering down the public health laws, right? I mean, the, 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 the roles and responsibilities of local boards of health or state boards of health are also, um, and laws here, at least in Iowa, um, you know, we had, we just saw the merger of two agencies. So this is all a lot of, uh, com com combined with other issues, this is also uh, the political realm in which we operate and work is, is, is a constant, constant, constant issues. Okay, so I, I want to try to uh, keep a conversation going here. So let me bring in Nicole, um, another state. You also were past president of ASTO. Um, you don't have the last year, I suppose, but I'm sure much of this was happening during your tenure as well. Can you give us a sense of how it played out uh, in Rhode Island? Yes, indeed. Thanks for the opportunity to join with this esteemed panel of colleagues. And uh, I uh, appreciate uh, Brian and uh, Mike's opening comments, and in particular, um, Mike you know, reminding that hopefully we can take some action steps with us from this conversation and call to action. So there are, in addition to the, the statements stated, um, I'll lift up in terms of the experience for me, um, the, the first being those administrative elements that are within the state, but outside the health department oftentimes, the rules for recruiting. I know a state that was using um, personnel statutes from 1988. <laughs> um, and so the ability to be agile and flexible and dynamic in the people that we are hiring um, has been challenged. So um, a, a call to action is figuring out how to um, continue to put energy, a ton of energy was put in it from, from my experience, but to continue to put energy into the partnership with the administration, the governor's office, those who are responsible for helping to update the statutes and the policies and the regulations that there then impact what the study showed is so important to staff, the flexibility, being able to telework, <laughs> <laughs> you know, something that was unheard of um, prior to. But all of these elements are normal parts of the workforce across the board. And instead of being held hostage as um, an agency within the state, continuing to figure out ways to really push on making those changes so that um, we can open up what's needed for not only pay, but you know, flex time and teleworking uh, uh, flexibility uh, and uh, d job descriptions and making it so that it's not as challenging just finding the job online somewhere and being able to access it. So that's um, one piece. Along those lines, what we are wanting to really elevate for public health is what are ways we can do public health differently? Um, how can we better support the communities where public health happens 
in making the changes in their living conditions that are needed? How can we help deliver on those services that we know are critical from a housing perspective and overcoming the redlining policies that exist and dealing with overcoming civic engagement challenges with voter registration and mass incar incarceration and justice system challenges, all of which connect directly to public health. That requires us to have uh, more creative and innovative ways to bring in staff that are reflective of those communities that we need to uh, serve more uh, definitively. Uh, that really gets at a few ideals, including making your experience at work more enjoyable because you're mission focused, but then also in, improves the diversity of the workforce. And it was one of the real challenges that existed because of COVID, we brought in more staff and more of those staff were talking about the institutional and systemic um, challenges that existed and making them feel like they were in a safe space for work or welcomed. They raised the microaggressions and um, the other, um, you know, um, problems that existed. So really keeping that in the forefront and using that as a driver for how we are changing the way we do public health and having the workforce reflect that is another component. The last that I'll mention that I applied to um, my experience is creating um, a Rhode Island Department of Health academic institution so that we could forge a more creative partnership with academia and help uh, allow for opportunities to advance in ways that included getting an academic appointment and publishing and, you know, um, uh, being a, a teacher and, and supporting the academic institutions and vice versa. So it added some uh, more uh, enjoyment, excitement and challenge uh, to the role while uplifting the importance of public health workforce. So I don't want to uh, be naive about the challenges, but I do think people come and listen to a session like this and they're they're looking for some hopeful uh, ideas as well as uh, maybe a place to share some of the pain they've experienced. Uh, Nicole, I really want to follow up on your la on your second to last comment about uh, the role of public health and, and thinking about it in the context of the workforce. So I'm struck, Anne, as you started, uh, you mentioned um, uh, you mentioned sort of you know the person on the camera and and all of the sort of the negative that came out from that. Um, but that that isn't the the typical interaction people have with public health. And if we could have more ongoing interactions that were not the kind that created the anxiety around uh, COVID, it, it seems to me that could be positive in both sides. It could be positive in terms of career development and recruitment, and it could be positive in terms of, uh, uh, of, of the, the positive, um, reversing some of the concerns about how the public reacts to, to the public health workforce. So I, I wonder maybe, uh, Anna or Promote, if you want to take uh, Nicole's comments and extend them a little bit is, does that seem like, is that a, a national agenda? Is that a viable agenda elsewhere? Or is that something uh, that, that leaders are thinking of around the country? Yeah, I think it's completely, uh, it's incredibly important. It's something that I think we're thinking about in many ways. Um, no, I agree. There's certain voices on the camera and there's a lot of hardworking staff who aren't there. And there's kind of this perception that gets trickled all the way down to the system that isn't the case. I love the quote, like it's hard to hate up close. And I think the more that we have integration between healthcare, public health, CBOs, community health organizations, and public health, the more we understand each other's work. And honestly, the more supported we are in that work. And so I think uh, thinking about the ways that we can do that. So, you know, Nicole talked about like academic partnership, all the data that states have and how that can lead to papers and publications and the rest. You know, how can that help with healthcare, with fellowships uh, to be able to move forward and having people come do internships I think that the CDC Foundation uh, experience during COVID <clears throat> was a really great lesson learned uh, and an example where federal funds could come in and didn't have to go through the kind of the state procurement processes and the FTEs, but we could get people really quickly on the ground, partnered with state and local health teams 
to be able to see what that was like. And I would love to explore that and move that further out. I think internships where people could intern for a short period of time, see what that looks like uh, and get some experience and be able to move forward. And I also think our public health teams, getting them out of you know their space and getting them as interactive as they possibly can uh, with the local community to understand what are they seeing and vice versa, then people can see that path. It's hard to see a path ahead if you don't see that direction. So I, I think that we need to own that within state and local public health to say, how can I rearrange the way that my staff works um, so that they are interacting in as many ways as possible. There's some comments and they're gonna put in the chat box. You know, I do think that the, the careers, the publichealthcareers.org has tried to kind of make it more visible to see what careers are out there. Um, and then the other thing that I would say is I often get approached by people who say, I don't know if I want a career in public health, but this is who I am. What do you have or what does that look like? And then you can figure out, you're like, well, you would actually be really great over here. Um, and so I see a lot of comments in the chat box of like, what does this look like? And how would I go forward? And what, how would I admit? And I would say, check out public health, the, the publichealthcareers.org, but then also reach out to your state or local public health and say, I'm a nurse who's interested in moving upstream. What do you, what do you got? And be able to see, because sometimes we might be able to find the right fit that it's hard to um, put specifically on the paperwork. Uh, that's out there and are oftentimes looking for just energetic, good people who show up for the climb, show up for the hard challenge and figure out that path. And oftentimes we end up making jobs. I am not as worried about the fiscal cliff from like the digital health perspective because states haven't been able to change their FTEs and the kind of their payment systems behind it in the same sort of way. So we brought in a lot of short-term non-perm people in that space. And I really think that we need to take that and we need to build in more regular permanent positions within the state. So we will have that fiscal clip, but I think we need sustained regular funding for public health rather than these boluses to make sure that that is sustainable and long-term uh, moving forward. Right. Uh, you know, I think we need to reimagine uh, public health practice and the biggest infrastructure that we have in our health departments, governmental health departments is really our workforce and anything we can do to ensure that they are uh, happy and they are taken care of. We have to build a strong, equitable, joyous, um, culturally sensitive uh, workforce uh, uh, which may increase our retention um, of existing staff. Uh, and we also have to adopt the policy of anti-racist uh, organization, uh, which is often ignored. Um, recruitment uh, being more challenging than uh, ever, it's, 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 it's extremely challenging. I mean, more challenging than ever. Uh, now is the time, I would say, consider non-traditional methods of building the workforce. And this may include looking at job description as some of my colleagues already described uh, in a more flex, flexible manner, you know, work, work from home, for example, uh, those kind of things could help us retain uh, the staff and you know provide provide you know better opportunity for those folks. One thing we have to also understand that public health is a team sport, right? I mean, working with all these partners, they talked about academic health department. We we develop academic health department here as well, and we are you know mutually benefiting from that relationship is, is extremely, extremely important. And then, you know, all the other nonprofit organizations that we have, hospitals, uh, healthcare facilities here in the community. So, so you know, that could enable us uh, to excite our um, uh, staff, not only to, to, to do the right thing, but also be part of this community, be be available there, be visible in the community, um, and 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 continue to do the right thing. Because you know, people, those who come in this field, are not really, really after money or incentives. They come because it's really something that they care about. Public service, uh, uh, working in governmental health agencies, is really public service, and they are passionate about it. 
Uh, so those are some of the thoughts that I uh, can share with you with regard to your question there. Thank you. Uh, we had someone uh, in the audience uh, asking about hiring out of under the undergraduate public health uh, pipeline. Uh, the specific question they asked was about challenges in uh, being hired for governmental jobs. I, I guess I want to broaden the question out a little bit and go back, Nicole, a bit to your frame, which is, as you think about some of the reimagining of the public health role, does that also change the skill set necessary, uh, the the credentials that you expect for people who are you're recruiting? You know, if you want to draw from the community, a part of it is you need the skills to get the work done, but you also need to match what's available in the community. So I wonder if you could maybe start with a. a Perhaps addressing that question and broadening out to to the the, the notion of of the skill set more broadly. Indeed, uh, certainly the the partnership with academia um, can lead to ways to improve that pipeline directly from public health uh, institutions and improve the. Um, ability of those public health student graduates to be well equipped to step into their role um, at a public health agency. Um, we had uh, created, um, instead of calling them interns, we called them public health scholars and um, a, uh, a repository for those scholars to be able to join at the health department and contributes to a particular project that the staff at the department was leading and needed to uh, advance so that there could be a win-win and also engage faculty. So it wasn't just staff responsible for students, but staff at the health department and faculty at the uh, in, uh, academic institution partnering together on like-minded um, interests in public health and together support growth of the student so that there's an opportunity to bring up students who are ready and familiar with stepping into those governmental roles or other roles across public health um, uh, upon graduation. Uh, in terms of expanding beyond that and um, bringing in reflections of the community, there are ways to get innovative and creative with demonstrating uh, competency and um, their, uh, the community members' ability to be equipped. Uh, so um, we had created uh, a certification as one example for community health workers getting credentialed in Rhode Island. And it did not necessarily involve having to have the formal education, high school degree, that type of thing, but really uplifted what are your life experiences that best equip you for this role? So similarly, what roles have you had in the community? How have you contributed? Um, what did you go through and learn about the system that allows you to be able to help inform and improve it and change it? Uh, transform it. Um, those should be the types of skill sets, you know, that you're also valuing to bring in the additional um, members of the community who can really jump in with that diverse mindset and um, approach and help shift how we do public worth and work help public health work and engage with the community and really get some of those long-term transformative outcomes that we know are so needed. Uh, that's a really uh, interesting way to think about it. And I'm, I'm so glad you weighed in with that. Um, I am curious, you know, we, again, we, we talk about the pressure and the constraints and the concerns. At the same time, public health careers became much more visible in the last couple of years than they were uh, to many, um, but only again with a certain portion of what public health does really in the spotlight and other parts uh, getting no attention at all. We don't know what the next crisis is going to be and we, 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 and we face pressures of all kinds, not just pandemics in public health. I wonder if uh, from your 
from your perspective, you you feel like, uh, in addition to the community orientation that we've discussed, whether the skill set that's needed for the public work, uh, health workforce of the future is um, is being broadly represented in your recruitment pool pools, or if everyone's just interested in infectious diseases and they have no interest in all of the other important things that public health does. I, I'm curious if you see that, or is that just in my imagination? I'm happy to jump in. I, you know, I, I don't, I think we see people interested for a series of reasons. I don't see it just in infectious disease, even though that's been a big part of it. Um, so I think a lot of people coming out from an, like an MPH understand that public health is much broader than that and are interested in that. I think that we get a lot of candidates who are activists. They feel strongly about moving something and sometimes working within a system where they serve at the pleasure of isn't always a great fit. And so I think just realizing that there is kind of that constraint in the job that we do. We serve, you know, our larger governments and those are their strengths and weaknesses in that spot. You know, I really wanted to lift up a comment Nicole said, and, and this is on us as state and local health departments is really looking at our job descriptions. And I see a comment in the chat box about X number of work years experience prior to being able to get a job. And I think that as public health, we need to be, um, we need to go back to our job descriptions and we need to say, what are we trying to get at? How much is that valuable? And can we do more on the job training to get people work experience uh, at the same time? And have a more uh, diverse set of skill sets. So as you know, Nicole mentioned, lived experience in a community. Honestly, healthcare experience, FQHC experience, homelessness work experience, it may not be public health experience and it may not be academic experience. It may be a variety and you'll be really uh, have a whole set of skill sets that can move that direction. My advice to people looking at the public health field and having a hard time doing it is, is twofold. One, getting a job, something uh, that is adjacent to public health, you know, working at an FQHC, helping to do some of their population health things, uh, working kind of in that space to kind of learn that. And two, um, my husband once said to me, you just got to show up for the client and you're never sure what that's going to take. Take a job and it may not be perfect, but man, so many times within public health, we pull people up who are shining, who may be in all sorts of tucked in little uh, places and, and spaces. And we're like, I need someone who can do this and their skill set. And they might be in the tobacco field. Next thing they know, you're like running the vaccine team or whatever that looks like uh, because you need that space. So working hard, showing up for that, being a part of the solution, you know, just as Pramit said, like being, it's a team sport um, and we just need good players. Um, I also think that making sure that you're aware of your, your interest in space. I sometimes find that some of the public health workforce feels like watching a fish try to climb a tree. Um, and I'm like, I just want you to be the best fish that you can be in the best pond. So what, how on my job can I make as many ponds and as many trees and as many forests to be able to all have this ecosystem that we need? But it's okay if you, uh, you might think your career is one direction and it's not a good fit. Move to something where you feel like it's a better fit because you might just be that great fish swimming in that awesome pond. So um, move between different sectors, learn what that's like. And those are our best directors and our leaders in the future are ones who have seen a variety of systems and a variety of ways of, of problem solving. And then they're really they're ready to serve and to lead within public health uh, when that time comes. I, I'm just gonna have to jump in from a personal perspective and say that um, poorly resourced state agencies make the work hard, but they make it a lot easier to climb, as you say, when times are tough because they need every hand that's there. And if you're there, uh, certainly the best professional opportunity that ever came my way was when I was in state government. So I'll just put my own footnote on that. Um, we've talked a lot about recruitment and I think that's appropriate. A little bit less on retention. Of course, we talk about uh, salaries and benefits and stability and, uh, and, and mission. Um, but I wonder again, if uh, as we come toward the end of this panel, if you have any concrete steps you've taken in your departments that you particularly wanna Re, uh, elevate for the audience as things that you've done or that you've seen others do that you think, yes, we all know those are the those are the things that keep people, but I just saw the best example of that and I want people to know about it. Any of you have some examples that you'd like to share? Um, yeah, let me uh, say this, uh, that, you know, although we are talking a lot about, you know, entire public health infrastructure, but there are rural health agencies, uh, you know, places like Iowa, they don't have anything really. I mean, they have maybe a couple of staff who are, um, and, and, and this article has not, I mean, this article has not included those very rural 
health agency. So we have to also keep in mind uh, how they are going to meet these challenges, uh, challenges, ongoing challenges and, and the challenges of future too. So that's another dimension that we must not forget. Secondly, I think, you know, we have missed out on the opportunity of branding and marketing our public health, uh, especially in uh, rural um, and, and, and local health agencies across this nation, uh, because, you know, we don't have that kind of um, resource available. We don't have those kind of funding. And, you know, my colleagues have been talking about this $3.2 billion funding. It remains to be seen because we have 50 uh, states and more than 3,000 local health agencies, how this funding is going to be utilized and for what's I can tell you one thing here that we are in Iowa and we received, you know, um, about $30 million for public health infrastructure. And out of that funding, 40% has to go to the local health agencies. Now, state has decided that they are not giving it to the local health agencies, rather they would create a regional infrastructure that, that we don't know what kind of regional infrastructure that is going to be like. Uh, so, you know, we have to learn a lot, um, specifically, especially after this uh, pandemic, and we have to reassess our um, way of doing work, how we can continue to engage our staff, marketing and messaging that I, I talked about, branding of public health. Um, current landscape of politicization, how we are going to address that, uh, navigating civil services structure, some of the my colleagues talked about that, uh, physical infrastructure. You know, the other thing is that uh, a lot of local health agencies, I don't know if you have seen, you know, they, they have uh, rough uh, leaking, uh, there is not, uh, you know, good good infrastructure, physical infrastructure to work in. We were very lucky to have this very nice state of the art building here a few years ago, uh, before the pandemic. But you know, it's not just one health agency or two health agencies. We are talking about national health here, uh, and we don't have any approach. We don't have any strategy at the moment. We are talking in bits and pieces. There is, you know, our conversation is very limited and, you know, sometimes we get excited and then the excitement fizzles out. So I think we have to have a unified, cohesive approach to deal with governmental, to, 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 to enhance the governmental public health infrastructure. And of course, unfortunately, we have to work in a system which is so much political. Two things that I might just add to like what some examples, I think North Carolina did some great work on just making really great videos of like, this is a really cool stuff that we do and as a recruitment. And it also like, just as, as previously mentioned, brings joy to the workforce that's there, right? I think we go where we look. And I think sometimes we are really good at public health at talking about obesity rates and diabetes rates and how people are leaving. And I think we need to talk about resiliency factors and we need to think about the joy of the work. And I think we need to do that in workforce too. I think that we need to bring up the joy and the incredibly profound amazing uh, opportunity that it is to work within public health. I mean, it has been the greatest opportunity of my lifetime that I wouldn't trade for anything. And I think we need to share those stories more. So I think there are a bunch of videos coming out and other recruitment tools. The second thing, you know, something that we did in Alaska and we used our state dollar, our, our infrastructure dollars to do this was to reflect, connect into vision. And with that, you know, we spent money to bring like our, our public health nurses who work across this gigantic state that's bigger than Texas, California, and Montana combined to come to our public health summit and to come to a two-day leadership thing. A lot of them haven't had the travel funds in 10 years to be able to come together. And so instead of feeling like you're on your own, as Perman said, like me and two other people in this community, being able to like reflect and connect with other public health leaders to be able to work in that space. Uh, everyone from our labs to our you know medical examiners to our epidemiologists, understanding each other's worlds um, and bringing that together. And then now we have regular meetings uh, that are done via Zoom just because of how far apart we are. Um, on a regular basis with a once a year commitment to kind of bringing people back together again. So um, there's a connection, but there's a comment by Jai Hyatt, the opposite of addiction. 
It's not sobriety, it's connection. And I oftentimes think that the, the opposite of many of our problems is connection. And so I think the more that we can build connection within our public health workforce with each other, as well as with our partners, the more that we can provide resiliency and the more we can look at where we wanna go, not just the pitfalls along the road. Yeah, that's really great. Um, the the last thing I'll add is, you know, this health affairs article uh, really lifted up the less than 35 year olds and those under five years in the public health workforce. Um, so in our call to action, we have a, a focal area that we can um, really target, particularly knowing the 80% projection with that group for 2025. Um, and so thinking about, you know, just the, the mindset, the energy, um, the um, creativity that uh, that generation brings to the work, uh, as leaders, we have the opportunity to somewhat block and tackle. Some of it sometimes needs to be refined and supported because it is in this larger system, but what are some things we can move out of the way that allow for them to really thrive um, I'm, I'm sure there's more of the understanding of what's needed for the community. How can we really make sure the flexibility, the, um, the, the teleworking opportunity, the opportunity to leave the office and go out into the community to engage can be offered uh, to that group. Um, and when I think about the amazing senior leaders that I was uh, so honored to be surrounded by um, at uh, the agency who were just committed and, um, and engaged. That institutional knowledge, we can think of ways to have that pour into our uh, less than 35-year-olds and you know, they are less than, than five-year-olds, uh, five years. <laughs> um, I'm sure there are different um, mechanisms, but you know, really keeping that in the forefront as a driver for ways to um, improve and respond to this call to action uh, can be helpful knowing um, the, the, the energy that that age group brings to um, public health. I'm, I'm glad you highlighted that. We tend to think of recruitment at the beginning and retention at the end, but what part of what the study shows is we need to think about retention the moment people are there. That's a very high risk uh, group for leaving. And obviously the retention strategies are very different for the under 35 who's been there for a handful of years and someone who has a, a, a life of knowledge and experience that you wanna retain. You need them both for different reasons, but they're not going to respond to the exact same uh, um, motivations and, and ideas. Well, uh, Dr. Alexander Scott, uh, uh, Dr. Devetti, Dr. Zink, got three doctors in front of me. Uh, thank you all for, uh, your contributions, uh, your both uh, today in helping bring to light these issues and and give them the reality of what it's like uh, out in uh, on the ground, as we say, um, but also your leadership in what you do every day. Other than this, we do need people in your roles and so happy to have been able to engage with you today. So uh, as I offer you my thanks for your participation, I'm going to invite back uh, Brian and Michael to just uh, have maybe a couple of minutes. We've got about five. Uh, if you have some reflections on this uh, that uh, draw in, um, now is a good time to share what those might be. Brian, I see you back on camera. Sure. If you want to, I got, I have mine on, but I can't unlock it. Somebody locked mine. So okay, well we'll <laughs> unlock you and we'll get you all back on. Thank you. I, I mean, I, I just want to say thank you, thank you to the panelists. We have you know, some real challenges moving forward. I still think there are questions that people have about, you know, I can't get into governmental public health, even though I want to. We have a lot of work to do on our side, but I really think some of the, the key messages, I, I know that pay, you know, passion doesn't supplant pay, but this is work that we got into to change the world and in governmental public health, you can do that. And it's really, calling to us and, and having the momentum to, to rebuild the system so that it can do what it needs to do. But we are gambling with very high stakes right now in our nation. And if we do not find a path forward to fix this public health system, it could very well be game over. I'm, I'm, 
kind of feeling like Sarah Connor in the first Terminator movie. You're driving down this road and you're not quite sure what's going to happen. If you haven't seen the Terminator movies, that is something you can do. That's an action item. But, you know, we don't know where this is going to end. And there's already some bat boogieing down with some pig somewhere getting that next pandemic all ready for us. And so we have to make this very important and critical for our elected leaders to understand. We cannot continue to politicize the future of the nation for all of us. And that's what some of us are doing. Yeah, I, you know, I would just add, and I thought the panel was fantastic. I could listen to y'all for another hour for sure. But I mean, it, it reminds me when we think about solving this problem, it reminds me of the the sort of the fable of the blind men touching an elephant, each of them thinking they're touching something different, you know, a palm tree, a hose, uh, whatever. Uh, it, you know, this is a systems problem and there's no quick fix to it. There may be some easier fixes than others, but I mean, we've got to really approach this from, from a systems thinking uh, perspective. And so there's things we can do for self in terms of burnout and resilience and moral injury. I like, and, you know, this isn't going to get solved by yoga, but you can certainly do yoga. <laughs> you know, it's a supervisory issue. How are we promoting and, and cultivating leadership in our agencies and making them places people want to work and being intentional about that? Um, it, it's a team issue, how are teams working together, especially remotely, that's, you know, happening everywhere, but certainly something we need to, to think through in health departments. It's the health department issue, which is a part of a governmental organization that is governed by rules that they don't have a lot of control over necessarily. So those things have to be worked out and played out in general assemblies and state legislatures or county commissions or, you know, city councils. It's a regional issue because we know there's places where this is a much bigger deal than others in terms of recruitment, although it is pretty universal. Um, but looking at frontier and rural areas, is, you know, that's a healthcare issue. It's a public health issue. It's a data issue. It's a lot of expertise issues we need to think about. And, and then it's a national issue. And again, it's not going to get solved federally, but it's certainly the investment we need has to come federally because unfortunately, there's, there's not a lot of, of extra in the states right now. So I, I do think it's something that um, we need to approach systematically. I can tell you probably one of the best uh, moves that the, the public health infrastructure program grants are going to allow states to do is hire a workforce director. There's who's in charge of putting this system together and solving these problems. It's not it's not um, reasonable to expect existing staff to do more, <laughs> you know, uh, and then we get more burnout. So, I mean, I think these these are folks we want to cultivate as well, uh, create a community of practice for them. Uh, involve the local and state leaders. Um, get out of the get out of this. Uh, it's a state problem. It's a local problem. This is our problem, and we have smart, bright, dedicated people to solve it. And we just need to tap them, um, just like we tap the expertise in infectious disease outbreak. This is a similar kind of urgency, and we want we want every health department to be a place people want to work, where they thrive, where they feel included, and they're given their best every day. And all of us who supervise our staff want to feel that way about our our places of work too. Well, thank you for those thoughts. And I don't know if I caught all of the levels where this is an issue, but the one I want to make sure we hear as is that it's also a community issue in the sense that at the end of the day, an effective public health infrastructure supports the needs as identified by the community and it draws its trust and credibility from the community, draws its workforce from the community. And uh, I think strengthening those ties will help build up from the community level through state and national, as well as the state regional, uh, the national, regional and state uh, helping reach down. We really need both of those directions to work. Um, so pleased to have been able to spend some time with all of you. Uh, now I have five doctors on the screen instead of uh, <laughs> uh, three earlier. Uh, that's, you know, when you're a lawyer and you're surrounded by PhDs and MDs, it, you, you have to uh, highlight everyone's credentials. Um, it was a great uh, conversation. A great conversation uh, with all of you. Thanks again to the De Beaumont Foundation for making this insider event available to everyone. Uh, um, we do have some additional events coming up, but before I uh, go through those, I do just also want to mention this is one paper of of quite a number in the March issue that we hope folks will take a look at. There is actually one on trust in different agencies. Uh, but there are many other dimensions around public health that I believe our listeners here would find of interest as well. 
So as I thank our presenters, I'll just mention a few upcoming events uh, at Health Affairs on April 18th uh, at four o'clock Eastern. Uh, if you're a Health Affairs Insider, you can join our professional development event uh, with Liz Jurinka talking about her experience uh, on Capitol Hill and the White House and as part of the White, uh, Washington Health Policy Community. Uh, on April 26th there, you'll see a, uh, uh, our journal club uh, looking at uh, increasing marketplace enrollment among households eligible for zero premium plans with author Andrew Ferrer. And uh, right in the middle here, we are launching a new insider virtual networking event, Bring Your Own Book on uh, Monday, April 24th at six o'clock Eastern. You can register for these and become an insider on our website. Again, thanks to our speakers, thanks to our audience. And with that, uh, we are adjourned. <laughs>